episode 81. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. You know, every time I hear that bump music intro, I I continually ask myself, you know, is it time to move on? Do I need to change that? Do I need to shorten that up? It is a little bit long. You know, but every time I hear that message, I'm just reminded, you know, we just got to do it anyway. So anyways, I like it. Tell me what you think. Head on over to the Business of Architecture Facebook page and give me your thoughts. Should I ax the bump music by Ben Folds 5 or should I keep it around? Let me know what you think. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. For over 10 years, architects have relied on Archie Office to power their office and empower themselves. Go check it out at archieoffice.com. All right, welcome back, Architect Nation. This is your host, Enoch Bartlett-Sears, and today I'm joined by Scott Larrick. He's the founder of 1159 Studio, a small collective of designers and architects based in the lovely city of Austin, Texas. So last episode, we talked a little bit with Scott about how he started his firm, his vision for what he wants his firm to be, and today we're going to pick it up and talk a little bit more about where he's going next. Um, Scott, maybe if you just want to give us a little recap about what you said in the last episode and bring our listeners up to speed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the quickest way to just recap it would, would be that uh, relocated Austin three years ago and decided to, to start a firm that was based more on my own personal sort of ideology rather than admittedly probably more that than a, than a solid business plan from the get-go. And so now we're in a phase of trying to, uh, trying to transition into a more sustainable business so that we can have a greater influence. Awesome. So let's lay, lay out the business plan for me. Tell me about these accessory dwelling units, the existing fabric in Austin, and kind of how all these pieces work together to kind of describe your vision to us. Right, so the, the business plan was was fairly straightforward, and I think this is, uh, I, I think the the strength of our plan really was that rather than just thinking about some work that we would like to do, or you know, some way that we thought was was a good, effective way to earn money, we sort of took a look at it from the the, the viewpoint of. What, what are the problems, you know, what are the problems that architecture could solve in Austin right now? So on a local scale, looking at what's, uh, what's going on in our community. And, and as I mentioned in the last episode, one of the biggest problems that Austin faces right now as it's growing exponentially is uh, affordability. And people are having just a terrible time finding affordable options for housing. And uh, rents are have just gone through the roof, sales prices of new homes have gone through the roof, and it's, it's getting really difficult for, we're not even talking about sort of low-income people, we're talking about, you know, they're, they're severely affected, but we're also talking about middle-class people and young people starting families that are having a, a real tough time just finding anywhere to live in the city limits. So, so we looked at that, and we looked at the way that Austin is growing, and, and it's starting to sort of spiral out of control, I think, where, where the, the, the new affordable areas are getting pushed farther and farther out of the city limits in concentric circles, and it's just leading to this, this awful sort of urban, suburban sprawl. And so we started off the business plan with identifying a problem. And then sort of working backwards to say, you know, what can we do about this? And we, we stumbled upon this, this uh, quirk in the building code that allows for these infill options on urban lots where you can build a small secondary unit. And they've got a history of, of being, you know, the, by nature, they're small. You've already got the infrastructure on the lot. So they're, they're, they've got the affordability sort of built in versus a ground up, you know, new, new house. So that, that was really it. I mean, we, once we had the, the problem identified, I, I would say that that was almost more difficult than, than coming up with the solution. You know? So we, we built a business plan around that, and we, we sort of looked at if we were going to make these, these units as, as great as they can be, you know, if we want to be good stewards of, of resources and of energy and of uh, the, the natural environment, you know, how can we sort of 
max that out and build what we think is is the ideal product to to deal with this this problem awesome so so tell me what what the what the actual business foundation of this are how how does the uh, the fundamentals of um, developing these projects were kind of walk me through maybe a typical project, how it would work, um, where you see the profit, you know, kind of give me some of the details about, about the actual business plan, how this things, you see this thing working for you guys. Sure. Um, so how it's, how it's evolved now since, uh, since, you know, from conception to developing the plan that actually was our, our you know, submission for the, the competition to where it's at now. We've sort of um, we're we're trying again to take a, a non traditional route. I think that the the path that we would like to go. So so when we did the architecture business plan competition, our our proposal was that we were going to try to develop a a small set of designs that fit you know these these fairly specific criteria for an accessory dwelling unit. And that we were going to partner with a prefabricator and you know be able to produce these things on a on a massive scale, so that we're getting away from the typical or the more the more traditional sort of one on one architect client relationship, and that we're able to to use you know our solutions and our our design abilities um, at a at a larger scale. I mean, I, I do recognize that a lot of people that sort of a lot of architects, especially that sort of rubs them the wrong way. You know, this, uh, this idea that, that, uh, one solution could, could fit all, you know, that you wouldn't be designing specifically for one site or one client. But our, our sort of, our take on that is that, you know, something's got to be done uh, about the affordability issues, about the sustainability issues of, of the housing stock here. And that uh, if, if our solution to that is slightly less uh, tailored to the individual client and site, but it's still, you know, 90% better than the, uh, the alternative, we're okay with that. So if, uh, you know, so we're, we're still on that, on that vein. We're trying to develop right now the, uh, the prototype for one of these units. And we're, we're in, we're, we're like heavy into design right now. We're working on financing and we're trying to, within the next year, actually build a prototype sort of a showcase unit that, uh, that we can then put into production and, and start selling these things. Okay. So would these would these dwellings be things that a homeowners current homeowners would then purchase and put on their own lots? Yeah, that's that's one avenue. So so one sort of uh, one you know one one arm of the business, one one way to you know generate some some funding is going to be to 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 yeah look for for individual clients who are interested in having one of these uh, some of the other avenues that we're looking at right now ships with some organizations here in Austin that uh, that focus on affordable housing and so ideally it's probably going to be a mix of uh, private individual clients and uh, sort of these nonprofit entity clients that will either fund the projects outright and then uh and then sell them off themselves or they will help pair us with uh clients that may have that may be lesser advantaged and they would subsidize the the cost of construction the cost of completing the project gotcha so you're you're getting you're working on the first prototype right now uh what what funds are you using to keep the business alive right now or what other work are you doing at the moment uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're scratching and clawing. We're, uh, we're sort of, we're still doing some other projects, uh, just, just sort of, you know, I call them architectural odds and ends to keep some money coming in the door. But, uh, our main focus has just been on, on buckling down and trying to get this prototype worked out. So, uh, we, we are trying to cut expenses anywhere that we can. We're trying to, uh, find alternative, you know, means of of keeping our ourselves afloat, keeping the lights turned on while we finish this up. Because uh, 
I don't know. I just I, I feel really strongly that this is uh, a good project and that it's something worth pursuing. And um, you know, if that if that causes us to dip into our savings a little bit to to see it through to reality, that's what we have to do. Excellent. And where do you see this going in the next five years or so? So that's that's I think what I'm most excited about is that we we identified this this sort of oddball niche in Austin where we thought we could have an impact. So this, 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 uh, this development option for an accessory dwelling unit is available to something like 40,000 residential lots within the city limits of Austin. Um, it's not very widely used right now, but I think that's going to change pretty quickly here as the, the rents and the home prices continue to rise. A lot of homeowners see this as a supplemental source of income. They either, you know, build this smaller home in their backyard. They either move in there and start subsidizing their mortgage by renting out the main house or vice versa. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. Yeah, it's just uh, I, where, where we see it going, I think, is to, is to use this first prototype and to use the, the sort of, we're trying to develop the technology and to understand whether or not our design principles that we're using to try to create these homes that, you know, as I said, are going to be carbon neutral, net zero energy, um, completely, uh, you know, what we think of as, as state of the art building technology. We would like to then, you know, take those lessons learned and translate it into larger projects that can have a, a larger sort of social impact. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think the next logical step from individual, you know, single family housing units would be to a sort of multifamily development that implemented a lot of the same characteristics, the same technology, the same sort of um, the same sort of, of mission statement you know yep. and and from there i uh i think it i think it just expands beyond that i mean it, it, this is i see it as almost as much of a an urban planning issue as an architectural issue and so i think we have a real opportunity and, and one thing we are actively trying to get more involved in is sort of the policy side of this and affecting the uh the change as far as talking with our city council and our, our mayor's office and trying to help the city develop ideas and new creative options for growing intelligently without, uh, without, you know, having a, a, an unfair impact on those who have a lower socioeconomic status and, and just a, a, a an impact on the environment that, that we don't, that we don't think is necessary. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this prototype that you're designing and developing right now. What are some of the, what are the, some of the challenges that you're coming across right now with the development of the first prototype? Well, I think, I think the, the, certainly the largest one is cost. So our, our goal is to, is to design and build a single family home, uh, for less than a hundred thousand dollars cost. So, it's, it's really become a, a very stringent sort of value engineering exercise where we're looking at every single component of the, of the construction, of the you know, technologies involved, of, of whether or not we can replace active technologies uh, for ventilation, for daylighting, energy, that sort of thing with passive technologies. And that's, that's really been the, the greatest struggle so far, I think, is just trying to, to keep the cost down. So the, the rest of it, you know, and I'm not going to say it's easy, but it all sort of falls into place, you know, with the, uh, the, the actual, if you think about it in terms of solving a problem, the aesthetic components of it, I think sort of take care of themselves. Yep. So what is, um, do you have any big insights in terms of the, uh, the sustainability or the design have you made, you know, kind of what's your biggest aha so far? 
you talked about your biggest challenge of being the financing. You know, what's been your biggest win? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't know that there's one specific strategy in particular, but I, I think it goes back to this idea of designing buildings just in general, the way that the buildings used to be designed. I mean, up until, up until about 200 years ago, every building on earth was effectively a net zero energy building because, you know, energy uh, inputs, the external energy inputs weren't necessarily available. So getting back to principles of passive solar design and daylighting and natural ventilation and being sort of creative about um, not necessarily, I, I think too often in this realm of sustainable design right now, it seems too often that people are taking the tact of letting technology take the lead and thinking that, uh, you know, you can basically create uh, whatever type of building you want oriented, however you want. And as long as you throw enough, you know, solar photovoltaic collectors on the roof or, or what have you, that you can sort of offset the, um, the impact that the, that the building is having. And so I think we're, we're sort of taking the, the opposite approach and we're looking at it as, as what can we get rid of? You know, how can we, how can we lessen the amount of technology that we rely on to make these things function the way that we want them to function? Well, I know we definitely look forward to following that and seeing what you guys eventually come up with in terms of uh, the design of this prototype. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier, there's not a uh, there's not a whole lot of information out there right now on the the specifics of the project we're working on. But if anybody out there is interested and wants to connect with us, uh, you can find our website, 1159studio.com. 11 is spelled out, so it's E-L-E-V-E-N-5-9studio.com. And go ahead and just shoot us a message or hop on our mailing list. And uh, we're, we're going to be launching a redesigned website and have a lot more information about this stuff coming up just in a, a few months here. So anyone who's interested, just stay tuned. Awesome. Now, before we finish up here, Scott, I'd just like to ask you, you know, from your experience doing the business plan competition, I'd like to talk a little bit about what it was like developing a business plan. Um, so let's just jump into that for a minute here. Okay. So, sure. yeah. So in terms of the business plan itself, you know, what was probably the hardest part of that business plan? It sounds like you said that once you discovered the problem, everything else kind of just fell into place. Is there anything else to that story? That, I mean, the, the biggest challenge for us, that's easy, was the uh, was working out the, I think that a lot of people would probably say this about writing a business plan, is working out the financial portion of it, you know, and then sort of doing projections and figuring out how this great idea of yours that's going to change the world is going to be able to, uh, you know, pay your rent for the next, uh, your mortgage for the next, uh, you know, however long. So that was, that was definitely the, the greatest challenge, especially when you're talking about developing, you know, affordable housing projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, that's basically the first reaction that we got from every developer and architect that we talked to for advice on the business plan was just that, uh, your business plan is going to fail because that's not a, uh, that's not a, a realm that anyone is making any money in. Mm -hmm. um, so, we sort of had to think about it more creatively and uh, and what we're what we're working towards is perhaps having as I mentioned before may, maybe one sort of arm of the business that functions for profit so there's this there's this concept of a business that is you know there, there's nonprofit businesses then there are there's this growing sort of movement towards uh, for for profit for purpose businesses uh, you look at you know, Tom Shoes, Warby Parker, some of these other businesses that, that use the sort of social impact as a marketing tool. And mm -hmm. they run a for-profit business and then, you know, reinvest part of that profit into uh, initiatives that they, that they think are, are beneficial. And I think that's really where we're finding that, uh, that it's going to go. And so we, we, had that angle sort of built into our business plan that we entered into the competition, but it's, it's uh, actually trying to figure out since then how to get this project funded and how to move it forward. That's going to become a, a huge part of our business plan going forward. So the, the idea of, of uh, you know, doing a good bit of work yep. at, market value and using the the profits from that to reinvest in in the initiatives that we that we believe in 
is is where it's going to end up. Awesome. Well, you said that okay, you guys were the winners of the business plan competition, and you had some uh, very good other entries in that particular competition for the architectural business plan competition. Why would you say, from your perspective, why did the jurors choose your particular business plan as the winning plan? Yeah, uh, and just just you know, right off the bat, the uh, the other entries in the competition were phenomenal. I thought, and getting to meet the other finalists out in Chicago and uh, and just sort of hear more about their their passion and the the plans that they were developing was really just incredible. I thought that they were, uh, you know, it was really a, a top notch set of individuals and of of firms that made it to the end. If, if I had to sort of, and and I don't know this for a fact, but if I had to sort of point a finger at at what I thought gave us a slight edge, it would just be that, uh, that idea of, of looking for a problem and then figuring out a way to, to solve, you know, rather than, I really think that's what design is all about, you know, as like when, when design is at its best, it's, uh, it's really just boils down to, to problem solving. I mean, there's plenty of people, plenty of architects who can design really cool looking buildings and can provide great service to people that can afford it and that sort of thing. So, so taking a look at a broader scale and saying, okay, there's, there's something broke community, something broken in our society right now, and what can we do to have an impact on that, to try to, to try to affect some change that is not only benefiting us as a business, but is benefiting you know, the community that, uh, that we live in and the, the people that we deal with on a daily basis, I think, I think was, was a slight advantage, just, uh, just having that, that angle of doing something doing something good or, or at least aspiring to go beyond where, uh, where a typical business plan would go. Awesome. Scott, thank you so much for joining us on the show on the business of architecture. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Love the you show. Bet. Yeah. And I just want to tell our listeners out there that we have, as Scott mentioned, we have had a couple other guests on the show that were involved in business plan competition. So if you'd like to go back and get additional insight from those interviews, you can catch the, my interview with Ryan Hansenuat, who's actually there in Texas too. And uh, that's, I believe, episode um, 74 and 75. And then we also have Catherine Darnstadt from Chicago, and you can catch her episode, which would be episode 78 and 79. And then, of course, the episode, two episodes you just listened to with uh, Scott Larrick. Scott, awesome, man. Keep up the good work and let us know how things progress with 1159 Studio. Yeah, well, keep in touch. Okay, man. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.